she claims that the actors other than you on the show were mean to her, disdainful, treated her like trash. I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I knew they did. And I knew the ones that did it. One was my best friend, but I'm not gonna mention names. I would never talk about Diane Cannon to you or anybody. <laughs> One of the other shows in the 50s dealt with a, a villain, an outlaw, Billy the Kid. And Billy the Kid has been in dozens of movies, the character of Billy the Kid. Chris Christopherson played him for Sam Peckinpah and Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Robert Taylor in 1940 for Henry King and Billy the Kid. Johnny Mac Brown in 1930. Paul Newman in The Left-Handed Gun, Arthur Penn's movie. Who played Pat Garrett in that film? John Daner's right. Here, you get another prize, right here. Western uh, Story Roundup. Okay. Let's hear it for Courtney, okay. So many people played Billy the Kid. Val Kilmer played him in Gore Vidal's Billy the Kid, which was also the same script that Arthur Penn used for, for Paul Newman, but it was done as a TV movie. Emilio Estevez, maybe one of the most popular, uh, played Billy the Kid in Young Guns and Young Guns 2. But of all of those people who played Billy the Kid, there's somebody who played Billy the Kid more times than Buster Crabbe did, who played him 13 times for PRC in the 40s. Bob Steele played him seven times for PRC in the 40s. But Clue Gulliger played him 75 Woo! times on The Tall Man. And he's here today. Clue, come on up. Seventy-nine. Well, most of my facts were accurate. You know, it's, all, it's my memory. But congratulations, that was great. But somebody in the audience told me, when we were growing up, he said there was only one man who was the ultimate quintessential Billy the Kid, and that was Clue. So we're thrilled you're here today. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, you know, we kind of like a family. All of us, the old Western guys here, we're all a family in one sense of the word. One of our brothers died, Grizzly Adams. Let's give him a hand. Sure. Dan Haggerty. Y you know, we are a family. Smiley Burnett the sidekick, the chief sidekick of Gene. Son was my stand-in on Billy the Kid for 79 episodes. He wasn't a stunt man, he wasn't an actor. He was what we called in those days uh, an extra, but they weren't extras. They were members of the crew, just like actors, musicians, grips, we were all together. He's now in the South, Smiley's boy, and he sells memorabilia of his dad. You know, we're all wearing Stetsons today. A student of mine gave me a Stetson for Christmas. Too big, I'm gonna get it fixed. Yeah, it's a little big, isn't it? <laughs> Looks good. What do you think, Bruce? Well, anyway, old man Stetson lived by me in Woodland Hills. I was mayor of Woodland Hills. He lived a couple of blocks up the street, the foothills of some little hills there, little mountains, in a big mansion. He was a cloth cutter, old man Stetson was. And out of his cloth one day, he formed a hat, put some starch with it, and he died with $15 million. <laughs> and uh, some say you can't take it with you. He did. And, and uh, 
Did they bury him with his hat on? I don't see too well. I'm an old guy. You know, I'm, I'm reading this stuff. All the Bob Fuller. Oh, what a name. Bob Fuller, one day, was feeling his oats many decades ago. <laughs> Even now. And he, and what he, he got on his bike. And he went to Universal. This was night. And he had Keely Smith on the back of his bike. <laughs> Keely Smith was a Cherokee Indian who was married to Prima at that time, Louis Prima. And they started going on these dirt roads where we made all our movies before all that crap was built back in, you know, in Universal. <laughs> and, and the security got after them and they went all over. They couldn't catch Bob with a bike, not in those days. No, you know, he, he didn't have, a, you know, 10 vats of whiskey in him at that time. He had two, two vats, you know. But they couldn't catch Bob. Keely Smith, I saw her at ye little club, a nightclub. My wife and I were there in Beverly Hills on North Cannon Drive. And she said, do you want to dance? I said, okay. So we went out and she started talking to me. And she said, you know, I'm a Cherokee Indian. I, I said, I know that, I know that. I said, and you're, uh, I hear you're a Cherokee. I said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Cherokee Indian from Oklahoma. And she said, I hear that Cherokee Indian men are very passionate. <laughs> I said, Keely, that's something you'll never find out from me. <laughs> That girl over there, that beautiful woman, is my wife. I love her dearly. And Keely looked over. She is pretty. I'd like to love her too. <laughs> I said, Keely, I'm not into that. And I went back to my table. Lou Wasserman used to take, he, he's a guy who bought Universal. Used to take Doug Manure McClure. Uh, used to take Doug McClure and me <clears throat> all around America to all the cities where he had his his uh, loan businesses. You know, he diversified. We went everywhere, Boulder, you name it. He didn't pay us a penny. I guess he thought being with him was honor enough. <laughs> he was wrong. <laughs> I know that Chuck Norris is a favorite of yours, favorite of mine. He's a good actor, he's from Oklahoma. Good fight. And I'd stopped acting when I went to Tulsa to make my movie, Bruce. I mean, I'd, I'd hung it up. I couldn't remember the goddamn lines. So what happened is that he called me up from Dallas and he said, why don't you come up and play my father on this Texas Ranger show? I said, okay. And I needed the money, you know, with the movie. So I went up there and I was dying in front of the camera on the, on the little bed. Right in the middle of the scene, I forgot my line. And I couldn't remember it. And it was dead silence. And Chuck was standing there beside me. He leaned over. He gave me the line. He knew every goddamn line in that script. And I hated his guts. <laughs> He had a photographic memory. I never knew that. I said, later on, I said, Chuck, you signed with the Cannon organization for $25 million. Pretty common knowledge after you made the first film. I made his first film with the first movie, Force of One. And so they signed him. I said, did they ever, you know, they went out. Did they ever pay you? He said, they paid me, Clue, every dime, every penny. They're good guys. And that's not interesting to anybody except Bruce, who loves money, like I do, yeah, yeah. I did some Playhouse 90s. Those were live shows, like movies, almost, uh, on television. And one of them I did, the first one I did, I played Elvis Presley, a character very much like him with a guitar and everything on the stage. 
And my part was little because it was my first thing there. So we filmed it and I went home and I was gonna watch it that night, you know? And I got a call, telephone call. I said, yeah, hey. He said, this is CBS. I said, oh, quit bullshitting, who is this? This is, this is really, this is CBS, we're in big trouble, clue. Diane won't come out of her dressing room. Diane Varsi was playing the dingling girl, the star of that show. And I said, oh shit. And I said, why, why won't she come out? And they said, she, well, she claims that the actors other than you on the show were mean to her, disdainful, treated her like trash. I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I knew they did. And I knew the ones that did it. One was my best friend, but I'm not gonna mention names. I would never talk about Diane Cannon to you or anybody. <laughs> and any, any, anyway, what happened was that I said, okay. So I went down and talked with Diane. I don't know what the hell I said. I can't remember to this day. It, I wish I could, but I'd like to tell this documentarian here, but I can't. So. I got her out of the dressing room, she did the show, and it was okay, you know, not nothing to write home about, but it was, she, she did the show. Then later I saw Dick Clark, her agent, good agent, good man, very quiet, very warm man. He said, Diane went home. I said, what happened? I said, well, she had that disease, you know, where you have the fits. What's that called, Courtney? Epilepsy. And a few weeks later, she died. And that hurt me a lot because she was a very pure kind of actress. And that's why those actors got pissed off at her. Eddie Albert, one of the great film actors, all these people, they got mad at her because she was so good. So she cared so much about her acting. And I don't know why they got upset. They shouldn't have, you know, they were gifted. You know, they, Diane Cannon and Eddie Albert, they're, they're very gifted actors. Bruce Davison is one of our premier actors in the city, literally. I mean, you could, you could give him anything, he could play it. So we were doing a movie together, well, the Wheat Brothers, and we did it. Pretty good, independent film, it was okay. We, we worked hard, he worked very, he's a very you know, good actor. So I did, a, I did a movie at Lake Havasu on London Bridge. And a guy named Swackhammer was my director. He said, Clue, we were, he was drunk and uh, stayed that way a lot. He was drunk. And we were eating with Ricky Nelson's wife. He was dead, she was down there with another actor. And I was there and we were talking and he said, you know, I could never be an actor. I said, why is that, Swack? He said, I have, my head's too little. <laughs> I said, your head's too little? What are you talking? And she said, actors have real big heads. Look, look, you have a big head. I have a little head, I can never be an actor. I said, oh, f off. And, and, you know, he was drunk. He didn't know what he was talking about. Well, the next day, we were doing, on London Bridge, a very important scene, where Adrian Barbeau, Miss Chest of 1945, had to run down London Bridge, almost the whole length of it, and a big, tall, lanky actor David, uh, what's his name, John? Hasselhoff. David Hasselhoff and I were in the movie with her, and we were down there watching her run. And it was like a little bit of heaven had come to the top of London Bridge. I mean, it was a thing to behold. It was magnificent. It was worth doing that crappy movie. Uh, it really was. And, you know, for men, I'm talking to you old cowboys now. I'm not talking to you pretty wives here. Just the old dusty cowboys I'm talking with here. People like me. And I did a show in Sacramento about a train. And Jeannie, remember Jeannie? The, I dream of Jeannie, that TV show? <laughs> that girl was noted for her large pointed 
mammary glands. <laughs> no, really, that's what they advertised in all the shows, all the posters, everything. They emphasized that. It was not me, um, but, but I noticed it. And uh, when she had to run down the tracks, I mean really run down the tracks hard. And Joe Namath was in the movie with me. And we were at the other end of the tracks watching. <laughs> and guess what? Nothing, nothing moved. It was like a board. No swaying, no bouncing, no jiggling, like a board. And Joe Namath and I could never understand that. We thought we were gypped. And, and you know, later on, that beautiful girl and her ugly husband, who played Cochise, remember him? Michael Ansara. Michael Ansara came to our house to eat, eat supper with us one time out in Woodland Hills. And Simon Oakland, one of the great actors of my day and Bruce's day, <laughs> you know, you know, he played uh, the uh, chief of police in Bullet, you know, the great Bullet film, you know, he, he, he brilliant actor, one of the great actors of my, of my time that I've worked with, literally, and he couldn't take his eyes off of Jeannie's chest <laughs> all evening. <laughs> he was just looking over at Jeannie's chest. It wasn't cool <laughs> at all. Very embarrassing. And I, I don't know why he did that. <laughs> but, you know, he died shortly after. True, uh, true. Let me ask you something because... Lay thinking, it on me, th Bob. Thinking, thinking about Barbara Eden reminds me... I wasn't going to mention the name. But reminds me of uh, Billy the Kid. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, may, you may ask me why. Why? Well, Jack Butel played Billy the Kid in The Outlaw, and he wore two guns, and his leading lady was Jane Russell, and she reminds me of that story. <laughs> so, so... You are terrible. Which You're a brings terrible me, man. Brings oh. me right back to where we started, which is the tall man, with you as Billy the Kid, and... Pat Garrett was played by Barry Sullivan, another terrific actor. What was that like working on the back lot of Universal on a show? Well, like when that? he wasn't drunk. <laughs> He, he kind of looked, to me, he looked like kind of an old turtle. And uh, I, I remember working with him, and I, I, I was hoping his neck wouldn't come out because it was really wrinkled. And I said, why the f*** did they get him to play this part? <laughs> but I know why. I know why. He was a good friend. He was a good friend of Lou's assistant. And uh, both were, you know what? I can't say it here. Oh, you've said everything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, both were coxmen. And uh, actually, he was so much into chasing women that Lang, who was shot one time in the groin by <laughs> Walter Ranger when he was with one of the Bennett girls, and we called him One Ball Lang from then on. Uh, <laughs> He wanted, he wanted Barry there with him to be, support him. Chasing girls is okay. Lou says it's okay. So they hired Barry. And Barry one time went up to Frank Price, who was running the show, and later ran Columbia and Universal, he big, big shot, and my best friend. Barry made a mistake. He went up there and he said, listen, this show's called The Tall Man, damn it. It's about me, it's about the tall man, not Billy the runt. And, and Frank said, I know that, I know that. Now get out of my office, fast. Because he wanted to cut my part way down. I got the job on the Virginian that Frank ran later because I, I was out of work, I needed work. And he hired me as a sheriff there, you know, Riker. 
The two things in my life that meant the most to me was number one, uh, Diane, my daughter-in-law, and my son, John, who's a filmmaker, and myself, we were making a movie in Tulsa. And we used to have to come, John and I, and sometimes Diane would drive across the country from Tulsa to LA to the lab. We had to, we were experimenting with a new form, uh, Super 8. It was, we were making the first movie. And uh, that was the most enjoyable thing, I think, in my life. We did several trips back and forth across country with John. I, and, uh, a lot of memories for me, an old man. The second thing was my wife, Miriam, who's not here now with us anymore, wrote songs. And my second favorite thing is listening to some of her songs uh, at home. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Uh, well, everybody has to get in on the act. I wanted her here with me today. Uh, some of you guys know that, who've lost loved ones. I think my life really has been extremely unimportant. And I appreciate this honor, but it's, it's really been unimportant. And I think life is full of unimportant events, like I've been talking about. Things that meant absolutely nothing to anyone. Things that happened with all of you cowboys. And that you remember them, no one else does. <laughs> but you remember them. And that's what our lives is. And it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You take down a steer, you brand it, you turn it loose. Who cares? You care. Now you care. And I do too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clue.